Hi, I'm Eric Hayes. I lead development for a small business that provides a reporting app for nonprofits like churches. Um, we would have what I say a medium database size compared to other organizations. Um, we have several tables that are in the millions or tens of millions of rows. Um, so we need to do everything we can inside the database. That's why a couple years ago I started really learning SQL and everything that we could do with Postgres. Um, and a lot of that is what led to this talk. To jump in, we need some target SQL to write. Imagine we work for a charity. The donor relations department wants us to help identify their donor retention or whatever. Um, this could easily be adapted for various product metrics like return visits. But usually I like to begin by experimenting with SQL first to find the results I want. Here's an example. I'm going to assume you know the basics of SQL, but even for a pro, this query could look daunting. Let's highlight the interesting bits. First, we want to get the first time a donor donated with the min aggregate function. We use the date trunk function to turn whatever date that is into just a month. This groups all of our donors by the first month they donated. Then we select one as a marker that they donated in this month. Next, we chain several similar statements together with a left join lateral. This special join allows us to reference values in the original G0 query. When experimenting with SQL, I like to use a pretty cool Mac app called Postico. Here I've loaded up the query and ran it, and you can see the results. So for each donor ID, um, we have the first gift that they gave, um, and then um, the last three columns are uh, one month out from their first month. So if they gave, if they made a donation four times, they have one in four columns. Now there's duplication here that we want to automate, and there are useful snippets that we want to rearrange or recompose on the fly. For example, this version gives us individual donor timelines. With a few changes, though, we can aggregate the data into counts, and now we have a cohort table. Well, we have the makings of a cohort table anyway. Um, we'd like to have uh, at least 12 of these columns, but you could see here um, how the sums have aggregated uh, the results, and um, we can start to see a retention over time. There are a lot more ways we can use this SQL. We can select different things, we can add where clauses, change dates, and get totally different insights. But you can see how this starts getting unwieldy to write by hand. One thing we could do is just build this with strings, using loops and string interpolation. And if this were the only special query, that would probably be the right approach. Just build it with strings and call it done. But as the number of different queries grows, it becomes harder and harder to keep things working as they are rearranged and used in different ways. My team inherited an app like this. It was littered with impenetrable blocks of unformatted SQL. We ended up writing around those files rather than trying to maintain them. Now the other thing we could do is do what Active Record does, which uses ARL under the hood. But there's a slight catch, and that is that ARL is considered private API in Rails. In this context, private means that it is considered an implementation detail that is subject to change without warning. Contrast this with an active record example. Here's something I ran into the other day. At least in Rails 6.0.2.2, if we pass multiple conditions to where not not, we will get the following warning. It basically tells us that the way this method works today will change in Rails 6.1. It also gives us a helpful hint about how to change our code today so that things work the way we expect after upgrading. We should not expect the same warning from a rel code. It's not like the code is going to be broken. It is tested with the rest of Rails after all. But the a rel code we, we write comes with a greater responsibility to test. This might be an unacceptable risk for your team.
But my team weighed the trade-offs and discovered that with a little test coverage, we were protected from unexpected changes. We've now carried our ARail code from Rails 4.2 to Rails 6.0. Let's take a closer look at ARail by comparing it with some active record code. Here's an active record query, and here's the equivalent query written in ARail. Notice we called to SQL on the active record code. To build an ARail query, we start by calling the dot ARail method on an active record model and storing it in a variable. We're going to use this in several places. Next, we call the project method to set up our select clause. I think it's named this way because they're trying to avoid collisions with other methods named select. To reference a column, we use the square brackets on table like we would with a hash. We use the shortcut arel.star to give us a correctly quoted star, and we pass it to the table because we want users.star to match the active record version. If we just wanted star, we could pass arel.star alone. In the where method, we reference the created at column on the table and use the LT predicate method to get the less than comparison with the date. Finally, we call to SQL to output SQL. Let's compare the output from each. The main difference is the string we passed is not quoted and doesn't reference the table. This doesn't really matter here, but it will once we start composing queries together. We want ARail to handle all the naming and quoting. Let's look a little deeper. What are these objects? The table is an ARail table. The columns are instances of ARail attributes attribute. The whole query is an instance of ARail select manager. It has an AST variable with many nested nodes. AST stands for abstract syntax tree. Now, abstract syntax tree is a computer science -y term for a data structure that captures the meaning or intention of code. This allows ARail to take our Ruby code and build SQL in the context of Postgres or MySQL or SQLite or any other database. In other words, we asked the system to get certain records from the database and ARail figured out what the SQL should look like to do it. When we call to SQL on this object, ARail uses the visitor pattern to turn the AST into SQL. Basically what that means is that an object called the visitor visits each node in the tree and decides what the output should be. It collects all of these little bits of SQL and builds the total query we need for the database. This is a simplification of course, but this is enough to get us started building our query objects. Let's build a simple query object. Here's our target SQL again. Similar to how we would refactor Ruby by extracting methods, we want to take the inner queries, wrap them in classes, then build an object to take them and put them all together. The first class we'll call the first donation query. Now, first of all, we have an execute method. It does exactly what it says, execute the SQL against the database. By the way, we delegate to SQL to the query method. The real work happens in that query method. Like active record, calling methods multiple times could build up duplicates of things. So we memoize the results to ensure we only make one pass through these steps. Donations is the ARIL table from our donation model, just like our first example. Then we call project to set up our select clause. It wants an array, and I like to define that in another method. It's a little cleaner, and you'll see later that sometimes we want to construct the columns based on some condition. The really interesting stuff here is in the month trunk method. To use a Postgres function that ARIL doesn't define itself, we can build a named function node. We just pass the name of the function as a regular string, then wrap the arguments to the function in an array. We use ARIL nodes build quoted to make sure our string ends up correctly quoted in the SQL output. A common pitfall is passing strings to ARIL methods that expect another ARIL node. 
Usually that means you need to wrap it in arel.sql or arel nodes.buildquoted. This is what we do when we want to select just the integer one with a given name. In order to build select one as gif zero, we need to cast the one as a string and then wrap it with arel.sql. Finally, other classes will reference the table and the gif date column. If we want to change the names here, it shouldn't break the queries down the line. Here's what our test for this class looks like. First, we just want to execute the toSQL method and make sure it works. Then we want to test the more complex things we're constructing. Finally, we execute our query in Postgres. Even though the test table is empty, Postgres will still parse the query and raise an error if we have syntax problems. Now we can have some confidence that if something changes in ARel, we'll know before we push it to production. Next, we'll create the lateral donation query. This is the part that will repeat, and so it will be initialized with a couple of arguments. It depends on the first donation query, so we'll inject that. You can imagine that if later we had a different initial query, we could pass that instead. Of note in this class is that we change the naming of things based on the position variable and that we build this month offset. The month offset uses the gift date from the first query and adds an interval of X months to it. In order to construct the interval, we use a unary operation, which simply connects the string interval with the month string that we pass. This is what the test for this class looks like. We can't execute this class as is, but that part will be covered by the next query. Next, we'll build our target SQL with what I'm just calling the timeline query. This is where we reference the two queries we just built and dynamically build it all with as many lateral joins as we like. The first thing to note here is that we're using a select manager instead of a table from an active record object. There are several reasons, but suffice it to say that a select manager has more abilities. For example, if we wanted to call with and build a CTE or set a named window that could be called elsewhere, um, we'd use a select manager. The next interesting part is that we reference the query from the first gift query as the from source. ARel is smart enough to know that we mean to use it as a subquery. Then we call as on it to give it a name and pass it the name method of the first GIF queries table. Again, this allows us to change the name in that other class without breaking things here. The next thing to note is the complex join that we're building. We call join on the manager for each month that we want. The lateral join segment takes our lateral donation query object and calls lateral on its query output. You'll see why it's handy to have the lateral query and join segment methods separate in the next example. This is what the test of our timeline query looks like. We want to make sure that each of the lateral joins build without breaking and that the whole query is executable. Here's what it looks like to get the SQL output from our timeline query. Here's what our query looks like when we execute it. Now that we have the timeline query, I'll just duplicate that file, make a few changes to our setup, and we have the cohort table query. Here's what that looks like. In this query, we build up the projection with a sum for each month. Also note that we set the where, group, and order clauses out of order from our joins. This totally just works with ARL. You can see that once we've built smaller reusable blocks, we can quickly reuse them in lots of different ways. Also, I'm sure you saw plenty of opportunities to dry up our code. Because this is all Ruby, it lends itself to refactoring. But let's move on. Now that we have our SQL built with query objects, how do we integrate all this with Rails? What does executing our query objects look like? This is what it looks like to execute our cohort table query. Calling execute returns a result object. And this acts a little bit like an array. We can loop through it with each, or we can just turn it into an array. 
you can see here we have an array of hashes um, with the column name and the value for each row. How can we use these to load active record objects? In this variation, I added a donors method that uses find by SQL to load donor objects. For this to work, I'm selecting star here and we're interjoining with the donor table. If we run this in the console, we can see that we get our donor model objects. As a bonus, Active Record has also loaded the extra columns from our SQL as attributes on each object. This has been a really quick tour of how you can wrangle up your wild SQL strings and corral them all with ARail and query objects. Uh, usually at this point, a speaker would point you to more resources where you can learn more. Uh, there are a lot of blog posts out there, but uh, some of them are kind of dated. Um, Google is your friend, of course. I learned by uh, looking at GitHub PRs and gists that other developers shared. Um, I think the source is kind of easy to understand uh, if you get the AST and uh, visitor pattern ideas. I think you'll be able to get through it. Um, you'll find that ARel uh, library in the Active Record gem. Of course, if you have questions, you should hit me up on Twitter. I'm at eHaze, and I'd love to help if I can. Thanks for watching.